Hello everybody. So I wanted to start a new series of just quick tips. I'll call it Future Poly Quick Tips, where we just have little lessons that are in five to 10 minutes, kind of explaining things that students have troubles with. Now, one of the issues when we're doing our architecture assignment is handling arches. So I wanted to give a couple pointers for that. First thing is, this is our placeholder texture. Remember, this is not our final, it's just dropping some photos in to figure out our UV layouts and what we wanna do. For arches, it's really tempting just to put the entire kind of curve of the arch on the texture here. Um, the problem is it takes a giant amount of space and it's not very usable for other types of architecture or other details. Remember, when we, when we create these details, we want them as modular and reusable as possible. So anything that's already a specific shape in the geometry is gonna be problematic because we wouldn't be able to take this and add it to a pointy, a more angular arch or wrap this around kind of a garden as a planter or something like that. Whereas these straight trim textures have plenty of variety. We could re reuse these in you know countless number of ways in our town, saving on our uh, production time and our texture memory. So uh, we can get that same result using some of these flat textures. So I'm gonna kind of make an arch that matches this shape in max and so a tool I hadn't used for a while is just the arc tool under splines so you go to the create tab and instead of our standard standard primitives you drop over to shapes and choose arc and you click and drag to get the width of the, the arch and you can snap to grid if you wanna be more precise. Um, but as you release, it'll pull up the arc up or down. So I feel like with this example, something like this is kind of matches our proportions. And right away in our um, creation parameters over here, if you want it a little more rounded, you can go into interpolation and increase this. Um, but before doing this, let's go into our rendering and we wanna enable and viewport and change it to rectangular. Remember, enable and viewport takes a spline and actually renders it. We could turn this into usable geometry. I'm going to, let's give this a darker color so we can see what it's looking like. There we go. Um, so, it's still a spline, it's still an editable, editable spline right now, but it, has, it at least renders in the viewport, so that allows us to go adjust these settings. So right now I change it to rectangular, and we can give some thickness, a quick way to get that nice arc geometry. Now even cooler than that, you can turn on generate mapping coordinates. Now that's going to give us a quick start to our UVs. So I'm going to load a base material. I'll load the placeholder one first. So go down to maps, click none, and we'll load up a bitmap. Remember that's just a regular image. And go to our placeholder texture, this guy here. Go up to parent and turn it on in viewport so it shows up on our model. Now I can just apply this onto our model. Now it gives us UVs, um, but it doesn't give us much uh, much control over how the UV, UVs look when we first create it. So we'd have to go into our editable poly settings. So we can just convert to edit poly. This is where we get all our modeling tools. I'm gonna do a few things here. I'm gonna delete the bottom faces and the backside. Most likely this would either be stitched into building geometry or it would just be jammed in to save a little on try count. Okay, and let's give us some more geometry on the bottom. We can just shift drag edges. Remember I prefer doing that. Um, it's just a little cleaner than having to do weird extrusions and then deleting the additional geometry. And we will still in edge mode. On this, I can actually just use my make planer to flatten that out. So I made planer on the Y axis, make that nice and clean. 
if I, I might want a few extra edge loops in, so I'll do ring selections on both. Go to connect, and then we get an even amount. Um, this just might come in handy for our uh, smoothing later, smoothing groups, or if you don't have enough geometry on long vertical areas, the lighting can give you some problems. Then I can flatten out these. Another old school trick of flattening verts out, you can just scale them down one axis. So I'm just kind of scaling on the Y and it just goes down to a planar point and won't scale past that. And just on these ones back here, I'm going to tr manually drag these down, even though it kind of skews it a tad. I feel that'll be a smoother transition. So let's see what we have here. We go into unwrap UVW, open our window, and we can turn on our details texture. Remember the texture doesn't have to be visible, the, it's still applied and the UVs are still a, would still um, work. Okay, so let's see what we have here. I deleted the backside so it makes kind of selecting the important details a little more obvious. So basically when you do an apply mapping, it gives you kind of a cylindrical map in the direction of the spline all the way around. So usually the back UVs were right here. It's all on a, a perfect square, um, but the proportions aren't necessarily correct on the UVs. So to change those, we'd go into checker pattern and we would want to scale these UVs. And I'm just using free form mode so we can drag from the corner. And if I hold shift and scale up, basically I'm trying to decide which direction these need to be scaled for the resolution to get closer to a square. Now, sometimes depending on the direction of your spline, you might decide you actually need to scale the other way. In this case, it distorts our texture density or text textile density even more. So I need to make sure I'm going uh, up. Now we notice another issue with the UVs. These are all equal proportions, but on our model, uh, these are a lot more shallow on the ends here. So we can identify which rows are the, the problematic ones. And it's these ones. And we can fix those manually. So I'll select them and then scale those in. Remember with UVs, you just want the proportions to be as close as to geometry proportions as possible to reduce distortion. Now this is looking a lot closer to the relationship between those UVs. And we'll probably, we can stitch this back together on this side. Let's see if that worked. Yeah, um, I used stitch to average as a way to stitch these UVs back together. Um, these don't always work. Uh, but in this case, it worked fine. Usually I try that before doing manual welding of the UVs. So that's pretty good. Um, and you notice that we still have some distortion here. And let's bring up Josh's question. He was UVing his arch. He, he set up the textures correctly where they're in a flat line, but he's getting pinching up here uh, due to how he set up his UVs. So um, by kind of doing it this way with basing it on a spline, you get the UVs wrapping around in the direction of the geometry easily. And then we can switch back to our details texture and scale these UVs to line up on whichever architectural details we like. This is kind of cool looking. Um, another nice thing about these trim textures is you might just move these around and find cool um, details you didn't anticipate. Uh, and that's, that's that flexibility and reusability that I'm after. So that's nice as well. Um, and this, this one has a couple of miscellaneous details on here. But if I was doing a larger city project, I'd probably isolate all my trim textures to be all horizontal or vertical. So I, I can get, have a lot of um, variety by just sliding the UVs around like so. And remember, let's 
straighten that out. Remember, once we have our unwrap, if we want to go back to edit or to modeling, we can right click and collapse to. That drops the UV down. Of course, we still have our UV changes here. Then let's go over a couple other options you might want to do. Um, we can add swift loops based on how our texture looks. So this is the term I use called modeling from a texture, which is a very useful part of development because a lot of times you have a huge material library of really well done materials and everyone's trying to, to share resources and get the game finished. So you, you want to be, have your textures as reusable as possible and you want other people to be able to open them and apply it to their building. So that's when modeling, making modeling decisions based on what the materials and textures available look like. These skills are very valuable and I feel like for students it's something um, naturally that they wouldn't have considered really just because it's kind of more of a development need limitation or whatever you want to call it. Uh, here I'm just doing loop selections. Uh, another cool thing I learned, you learn something new every, every day, but um, the chamfer setting, um, chamfer can be problematic depending on the geometry, but if you're just doing it on clean edge loops like this, it's really nice to round stuff off. But the thing I, I realized, notice that UVs are still intact. And that's extremely valuable. So I'm adding nice chamfer on the bottom edges, uh, rounding off these corners. and the UVs are intact. We have some smoothing groups issues, which I'll adjust in a second. And you can also, we can chamfer the inside kind of corners of things. So I'll do the same thing here. Go to my chamfer settings and probably don't need that as much, but just a little bit. Um, these are deep, these types of things, these details here. Um, I would make these decisions based on the context in game. So if this was a detail that's kind of um, at the bottom of our, our main building, it's kind of a focal point in the story that you walk right up to, then I'd go into this kind of detail. But if it's the top top floor, you know, of a building, I'm not gonna go in and chamfer these edges and I wouldn't have this many segments on an arch. It also depends on the how many arch windows are on a, are on a building. You kind of weigh all those decisions when you're making um, making a model and you're also the nice thing about those decisions none of them uh, the material and texture layout um, are independent from those decisions so you can optimize or make them more detailed and the materials still work uh, the last thing I'm doing here I'm selecting these outside edges and I want a little bit of a flare kind of taper to these so um, if you just scale them you see the issue, they're kind of scaling together. But if I want it to flare out, we can switch this selection to vertex. So I converted selections by holding control and clicking vertice. And then I can use the push modifier to a specific selection. So we can push that out. Convert back to edit poly. Now that's kind of looking a little more polished. Um, but after the after doing some of the chamfers, we have some hard edges from our smoothing groups. So we can remedy that just by selecting all the polys with control A, dropping down to smoothing groups, and I'll do a clear all. And first we can do auto smooth at 45 degrees. Basically anything uh, within 45 degrees angle difference will smooth together. So it, um, that's a good kind of default. If something's like a hard edge, 90 degree angle, it'll be a chiseled, chiseled uh, smoothing group. So that's an example here. This is shading separately because that angle difference is more than 45. So if I wanted to fix that, I can manually select that ring, hold control and switch to a, a face selection. I could clear the smoothing groups just from that selection, and I could give these their own smoothing group. So I could give it seven. Now, 
that little um, piping has its own smoothing. Okay, now um, I'm going to take this model here and I'll apply it to one of our more final materials. Remember, this is just a placeholder texture. So it's called Arc 1. Save it and merge it into my export file. So this is the working building that we we're using in class. So I'll go to import merge. Remember, import merge is when you're just want it, wanting to merge over at other max files. So I can bring that arch over. There it is. And this file is already set up for export. So I'm just going to apply the material, the export material, the cryogen material to this object. And I need to set its material ID to match our details material. And because I laid my high poly uh, details out in the same order as my um, placeholder, these UVs should already line up anyway kind of an advantage of that workflow. And then we can, in our export list under utilities, we see the main body of this building is, is selected up here and everything else is just linked to it. So with this arch, I can use select and link. And that lets us just have things separate. For instance, all these objects are just separate indiv individual pieces. These windows are instances. Um, and that's a nice way to work. So you don't have to, you know, collapse everything and stitch it together. You can keep things separate as you're working on it. It's going to be a lot more user friendly. Uh, so still, we only need one, the, the kind of parent in the export list. You can export nodes. Hop over to CryEngine. You should see the arch. In this uh, material that looks kind of best when you get some glancing angles on the sun coming over, a lot of the definition will start showing up. So that's a technique for arches. You can, you know, um, pretty much handle any kind of archway with this technique. You can use less segments if it's if it's something you're going to repeat more often. Um, yeah, and this is an example of just those flat that flat material. Um, and you can pretty much use this on any type of building. So I hope that helps and look forward to more of these little kind of quick videos.